will be given by Ashish Jain. Ashish Jain, please. Yeah, so hi, I'm Ashish Jain from Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. And this work has been jointly done with Dr. S. V. N. Vishwanathan from Purdue University and Dr. Manik Verma from Microsoft Research India Labs. So the problem we are trying to address here is that there is a lack of a general purpose efficient optimizer in kernel learning. So there exist a dozen of optimizers in kernel learning, but all are specialized algorithm and they cannot be used for any new formulations. So practitioners in kernel learning come up with a new formulation to address some real life application. But then these formulation typically necessitates the development of a specialized algorithm. So there exist general purpose algorithm, but they are very, very inefficient. So over here, we propose an algorithm which is scalable and efficient and can scale up to a million kernels and half a million training points. So the objective in kernel learning is to jointly learn both the SVM and kernel parameters from the training data. Two important factors in kernel learning is the way we combine the base kernels, which is known as kernel parameterization. We can combine them in a linear manner, which will give us a convex optimization problem, or in a non-linear manner, which will give a non-convex optimization problem. And the second factor is that the kind of regularization which we use, which will decide the sparsity of the solution. So we can use a sparse regularizer or a non-sparse regularizer or a log determinant regularizer and there are many other options. So by the sparsity, I, I mean that the number of the kernels weights which goes to zero. That is the number of kernels which we choose. So some of the motivation behind kernel learning and why we should do it. So the recent studies have showed that kernel learning is good for object detection and we can refer to this paper and kernel learning has given state of the art result on Caltech 101 which, which is object recognition data set and uh, kernel learning have also been used for feature selection so in a paper by Verma and Babu in 2009 ICML they used a non-linear combination of kernel for feature selection and obtained better results than other feature selection techniques so shown is the generalized multiple kernel learning primal formulation I call, I'm calling this generalized because it doesn't assume anything about the loss function which we are using, the way we are combining the base kernel or the kind of regularization which we are using. So the RD term on the rightmost side is the regularizer. The kernel information is embedded in the phi D term and capital L is the loss function. And we will be optimizing this objective function in the coming slides. So we are, there are just, just two mild constraints that the resultant kernel matrix should be positive semi-definite and the kernel function and the regularizer should be smooth and continuous function of the kernel weights. So if we replace the loss function by a binary hinge loss, we will get the formulation for a binary classification. So we'll be, uh, I'll be talking just about binary classification, but it can be easily extended to other loss function as well. So in the primal, we can see that if we fix the kernel weights D, then this primal is exactly similar as that of a standard SVM primal. So from the primal, we go to the intermediate dual, which is a saddle point problem. So to get the intermediate dual, we keep the kernel weights fixed in the primal and introduce dual variables with respect to the remaining primal variables, which is W, B, and Xi. So we get the intermediate dual. So again, in the intermediate dual, we can see that if we fix the kernel weights, then it is same as a standard SVM QP. So yeah. So the standard algorithm to uh, use to solve this is uh, just a second. Yeah. So the standard algorithm used to solve this is uh, a wrapper based algorithm in which there are two loops. There's an outer loop and an, and an inner loop. In the outer loop, we perform optimization over the kernel weights, keeping the dual variables to be fixed. And in the inner loop, we keep the kernel weight to be fixed. And if once we fix the kernel weight, then we can use any QP solver to find the optimum alpha star. So the existing algorithm solve the outer loop using a projected gradient descent based algorithm. So actually I have missed one slide over here. So yeah, so the projected gradient algorithm, which is the existing algorithm, it works in the following manner. So if we are starting from an initial point X naught, we move in the direction of negative gradient and reach a point X one. Then we take another step and if we move out of the feasible region, then we project it back into the feasible region. And then we take another step to reach X3 maybe and then finally we reach the optimum. So, but this algorithm as I told in the starting have many limitations. So, it requires many function and gradient evaluations because being a first order method, there is no initial step size information available to us. 
it uses armijo rule as a line search condition which forces a monotone decrease in the objective function and because of that many step size proposals are rejected and in case of an inaccurate gradient value then pgd will take many tiny steps before reaching the optimum secondly so if there is a noise in the function of the gradient value then pgd can get stuck at a point which is far away from the minima and then fails to converge pgd requires very high precision inner svm solutions in order to get the accurate gradient and function value which is again very expensive and finally pgd requires repeated projection into the feasible region which will also be expensive if the feasible region is complex and not as simple as a box constraint so we add in order to overcome the limitations of pgd we add three components to pgd to get a robust optimizer so the first component we add is that instead of using a projected gradient as a direction of descent we uses use a spectral projected gradient as a direction of descent which takes into account the second order information so the we we do a quadratic approximation to the original function and uh, the approximation is very simple in the sense that the hessian is approximated as a constant times the identity matrix it a very coarse approximation so uh, and that constant is known as the spectral step length and it can be calculated as shown so on the left hand side we can see contours of the original function so at x not if we do a quadratic approximation so we can see contour of the approximation on the right hand side so the contours of the approximation are circular which shows that the hessian is isotropic so this slide shows that how do we reach at this approximation and why does it make sense so suppose that uh, we have two points x0 and x1 x1 is the current point and x0 is the previous point so in order to get this approximation we impose two conditions the first is that at the current point x1 the gradient of the original function and of the approximation should be same and at the point x0 the projection of the two gradients on the line joining x1 and x0 should be same so if we impose these two condition and work out the maths we will arrive at the conclusion that the hessian of the approximation is an constant time the identity matrix and the constant is the spectral step length so by using the spectral projected gradient we get another advantage which is just a single projection per step so what happens in case of a projected gradient so if you are at a point xt and you want to take a step you will move in the direction of negative gradient if you go out of the project of the feasible region you will project it back into the feasible region and then you will use the projected point and plug it into the armijo rule and check whether that line search condition is satisfied which in major cases are not uh, is not satisfied and if it is satisfied then you will stop you will accept that point otherwise you'll take a smaller step in the direction of the negative gradient you'll again project it back into the feasible region if it is again not satisfied then you'll repeat the procedure so there are multiple projections just to take a single step but what we are doing in case of a spectral projected gradient we move in the direction of the so there is just single projection operation we find the spectral projected gradient and once we have the spectral projected gradient we take step in that direction and in in most of the cases the first step size is accepted in our case because of the second order information which we use so the the second component which we add to pgd is the non monotone rule so instead of using the armijo rule as a line search condition which forces a monotone decrease in the objective function we uses a non monotone rule that is we relax our objective function to increase in between on an average it will decrease but it can increase in some iterations so this makes our optimizer robust to function and gradient noise so as you can see over here that because of the function noise spg may underestimate the objective function value and dip below the uh, global optimum but it can recover from there because of the non monotone rule on the other hand if we were using pgd it would have got stuck at that point and would have just stopped the the third component which we add is the inner svm precision tuning so what happens in case of a pgd it uses a fixed inner svm precision and that and, and and which is very high in order to get a uh, accurate function and gradient value but in our case we have a tuning strategy and we start with a very coarse inner svm precision and we update it as we move closer to the optimum so the way it helps is it that the total number of steps might increase but the time per step will be significantly less so as we can see from the plot that in case of a pgd that pgd will take fewer number of steps but the time is approximately 6 hours but in our case that 
we have more number of steps, but the time per step is significantly less. So, SPG have many advantages. It requires fewer function and gradient evaluation because of the second order information we use and because of the non-monotone rule. It is now robust to function and gradient wise because of the non-monotone rule. Uh, we never need to solve inner SVN to, to a very high precision because of our tuning strategy. And finally, we need to perform only a single projection per step, which saves time. So shown is the SPG algorithm. We initialize the kernel weights randomly. And in step four, with fixed kernel weight and inner SVM precision, we solve the SVM QP using, using lib SVM QP solver to, up to find the dual variables. Then we find the spectral step length. In step six, we find the spectral projected gradient. So there is just a single projection operation involved. And then using the non-monotone Rhine search rule, we find the step length. And uh, in step eight, we check that how far away we are from the optimum, depending upon the norm of the gradient. We tune the inner SVM precision using our tuning strategy. And in step nine, we update the kernel weights. And we just, just repeat this procedure as long as we don't converge. So now moving on to the results. So we have experimented with four different MQL formulations in order to show that we can adapt to every formulation and our optimizer is generalized. We have tested both with large scale and small scale experiments and uh, with varying number of kernels. So shown is the results on, on, on cover type. Cover type have approximately more than half a million training points and it is one of the largest data sets on, on which a single kernel SVM can be trained. So we are training a multiple kernel over here using five base kernels. So SPG took around 20, uh, around 64 hours to train on this. And uh, but the key points are that SPG took only 26 inner SVM evaluations. So for every iteration, there was just one inner SVM solution. And out of the 64 hours, the first 44 hours were spent just to solve the just to take just for the first SVM evaluation, which is you are uniformly summing the base kernels. And the memory used was not much. It was it was run on a system with a limited memory and only 0.19% of the support vectors were cached. So results on Sonar. So on Sonar is a small data set with just 208 data points. So here we went up to a large number of kernels, which is a million kernels. And uh, so most of the current algorithm just go up to 10,000 kernel with an exception of our algorithm SMOMKL, which goes up to 100,000 kernels. So SPG took around 105 hours to converge on uh, Sonar and shown is the plot that how we scale with the number of kernels and how does PGD scales with the number of kernels. So these are plots up to 100,000 kernels. So both algorithms scale linearly with the number of kernels, but the constant involved for PGD are very high. So these are results on some other small scale data sets with sum of kernels and L1 and L1.33 regularization. So on most of the data sets, PGD fails to converge and wherever it does converge, it's much slower than SPG. Here we compare PGD, uh, SPG to specialized algorithms which are made just for a single MKL formulation like Shogun and Simple MKL which can train some of kernels subject to L1 regularization. So on the data sets we experimented with, SPG was always better than Shogun and Simple MKL. SPG was always twice at least faster than Shogun and, on, and in some cases the gains were even higher. And so here we can see that SPG is, can also maybe beat specialized algorithms, being, though being a general purpose optimizer itself. So now here we use product of kernels instead of sum of kernels, which pose a very challenging non-convex optimization. So here PGD fails to converge on majority of the data sets. And wherever it does convert, it is very, very, like very inferior to SPG. So now, as I told that we have added three components to PGD to get SPG. Now this slide explains that why each individual component is important. How does each individual component contributes and why combining all three gives the best result. So on the leftmost side, we have PGD, we have the runtime and we have the number of inner SVM evaluations required. So on the second column, we add non-monotone rule to PGD. That is, we remove the Armijo rule from PGD and add the non-monotone rule uh, line search criteria. So on almost all the data set, runtime decreases, but not by a large amount. And even inner SVM evaluations decreases. 
on the on the third column we just add second order information to uh, pgd that is pgd plus s so again on most of the data set there is a decrease in runtime and even the number of inner scm evaluations decreases and finally we combine the two components that is non monotone rule and the second order information and this is when when we get the best results and also the minimum number of SVM evaluations on most of the data sets. And finally, the inner SVM precision tuning, which I talked about. So the effect of precision tuning is noticeable on large scale data sets when solving a single QP takes a lot of time. So over here, we, 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 we first have PGD, then we have PGD, basically SPG without the precision tuning, inner SVM precision tuning. And then on the rightmost side, we have the complete SPG. So in the last two columns, we can compare that if we add the inner SVM precision tuning, then the runtime decreases by around 50%. So it is also important. So when we combine all these three things, we get the best results. So this is how we scale with the number of training points, how the two algorithms, PGD and SPG, scale with the number of training points. So both algorithms, so we went up to 32,000 training points on adult. And both algorithms are sub-quadratic with the number of training points. But as I told before, that the constant involved for PGD are much higher. So I would like to conclude that we have developed a generic optimizer which is efficient and scalable. We have experimented with a wide spectrum of data sets and also formulations. And we have shown that when we combine SPG and uh, the non-monotone rule, then we get the best results and the individual component won't give the best results. And why we can't use quasi-Newton methods over here? Because quasi-Newton methods don't work well when there is a gradient noise. And in case of MKL problem, there is always some gradient noise because we can't solve the inner SVM to a very, very high precision. Finally, I would like to acknowledge Kamal Gupta and Subhashish Banerjee from IIT Delhi and the entire CSC group at IIT Delhi. Yeah, we can have some question. So, uh I just have a very minor question. Uh, in the experiments, uh, when you compare with uh, uh, plus n and plus n, yeah, this table, for the first case, uh, PGD plus n is significantly better than PGD plus s, but for the other case, uh, plus s seems more effective. Yeah, so, so uh, basically plus s brings into account the second order information. Yeah, but uh, so why is it for the first uh, data, the plus n is much more effective? Is there any reason? Yeah, so as such, I don't have any particular reason for that. So, okay. uh, just uh, depends on data. Yeah, maybe okay. yeah. So, but like for a majority of data, data sets, we can see that plus s is doing better than plus n, okay. and uh, like, but for Australian, it doesn't do well. So, any other question? Okay, next thanks speaker.